Okay. Are we ready to rock and roll? We're ready to rock and roll, brother. We're in my language that I've just started recently adopting. We're rocking the hospice. (laughs) (laughs) But with respect to the grieving thing, let me just ask you if you're familiar with a few of the things that have been um, pretty foundational uh, for me. The the Kubler Ross stages have not been foundational for me. I found them to be useful at times, a useful tool in speaking about not stages like one necessarily follows another because people do them in all kinds of different order. But it seems to me that whenever dealing with a starkly painful or uncomfortable or loss or potential loss or whatever message. Um, most people do experience in some order or another denial, anger, bargaining, depression. And it can be all over the place. And sometimes people spile back and forth and everything else. My work has been focused almost entirely because that was originally that formulation originally emerged out of, you know, grief of individuals, somebody like, you know, like you and Betty, like, like dealing with, with terminal stuff and, you know, that sort of thing. I've been applying it at at a systemic level. I mean, I went through my own shit, probably. I don't know when the last time you and I had a real heart to heart talk. Was it before I had cancer after? Did you, I mean, I'm assuming it was before it. it was before. Yeah. You had your cancer gig in between. Yeah. So I was diagnosed on a Thursday. It was confirmed on a Friday. I was, I was, you know, had an ultrasound on Thursday, cat scan on Thursday, I was told on Friday, uh, it looks it looks like you got a tumor and it's probably cancerous. We'll know more with the, with the results of the biopsy. I went through a two days of like, oh fuck, why me? It's fear, terror, not denial, but just like fuck. I'm only fifty years old, you know. And this was fourteen years ago. Um, and then I just reminded myself of the things that are really truly foundational to my worldview which is one of them is I use the the cute G earth emoji D like my relationship to God, to reality, to, to the biosphere, to the cosmos, to the, to the, to the whole shebang that I'm a part of it. I'm an expression of it. I can't be disconnected from it. And that, that identity, that expanded sense of identity, both in time and in space fundamentally informs everything for me. So I was remind, I reminded myself of that. I reminded that in that sense, I, in a larger sense, am millions and billions of years old, that I am as large as the biosphere and the cosmos. So in a very real way, even if Michael Dowd died in the next eight months, which was a very real possibility, I had such an aggressive cancer. It was a diffuse, large B-cell lymphoma, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And it was so aggressive that um, had the chemo that they wanted to use with me not worked, I would have died in eight to 10 months, most likely. And so fortunately, they had developed this chemo only two years earlier. Uh, rituxan was one of the was one of the key things. And it targeted the very protein my cancer was made out of. And, and in fact, after the first infusion, like a, a week and a half or two weeks after the first infusion, Connie and I did an extended hike and, and, and the tumor went from where you could see it. Like if I was bare chested, you could actually see where it was bulging out to where you couldn't hardly feel it anymore. It was in my spleen. So that's when I knew that the, the chemo was likely to work, but I never lost that sense of the peace that passes understanding. I never lost that sense that even if I die soon, which I'm going to die at some point, whether it's, you know, six months from now or, you know, 20 years or 30 years from now, I'm going to die. And, and, and I had always, I mean, you're familiar uh, or I remind you, but in TGV and thank God for evolution, I have a whole chapter on death and sort of the rituals around death and sacred science around death and mortality and all of that kind of stuff. Um, so I've basically applied that. I'd sort of like, okay, let's, let's not talk about just death in the abstract. Let's talk about the fact that you could be dead in 10 months. How are you going to be with that? And I felt the fear. I felt the, oh, fuck, sort of like, why me? All that kind of stuff. But then within literally two days of meditating on that, I came to a place where I was 95% filled on a day, hour by hour, day by day basis with gratitude for the past, 
And I was grateful for my life, grateful for all that I've learned, grateful for my relationship to my wife, grateful that I was clean and sober, grateful that I've got a great relationship with my kids, grateful for all that stuff, and grateful that my genetic legacy, my kids, and at that time, at that time, I don't even, I don't even remember if I knew that my oldest daughter was pregnant. We now have a 12 year old granddaughter, but I'm not, I'm not sure that I knew because she was born in November. No. So, she, so she wouldn't have even been conceived yet. So I didn't have grandkids yet, but my kids, I felt good about my genetic legacy and my mimetic legacy, my ideas, you know, my book was still really doing well. And some of my other stuff was getting out. So I felt good about my genetic and mimetic legacy, which allowed me to feel gratitude for the past. And then when I look to the future, including a future that might very well not include me much further, at least this expression of me, I had trust. I had trust that went, went deep to my bones. I had trust that whether I die in two weeks, two years, 20 years, it didn't matter. The trust was the same. And I trusted. And again, part of that was the identity piece with the universe and God and all that kind of stuff. So once I had that, oh my God, I lived fearlessly. I lived with joy every day. I didn't, I not only didn't deal with the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, it transcended all that. I got to, I got to not only acceptance, but accepted grounded in an even deeper trust than that mere acceptance of the fact of my mortality. It was a trust grounded in the way of nature, the way of life, the Tao, the, you know, the way, the way things really are. And so the only other thing I want to mention is that between the time when my last chemotherapy infusion, so I took six chemotherapy infusions from September till I think December 3rd of 2009 was the last one. And then in the first week of February, I think February 7th, I had, oh, wow, we just passed the anniversary of that, I forgot. But, but, but February, uh, in early February of 2010, I had my spleen removed. And in between that time, I was introduced to the work of Stephen Jenkinson and the whole and Grief Walker. And not only did I watch Grief Walker, but then he came, he and his wife, his young wife, came down to uh to Whidbey Island and was present. They did a showing of, of Grief Walker, and then he, you know, answered questions for an hour and engaged the audience for an hour. So his work, his writing, but also especially Grief Walker. All the epic of evolution stuff on death and the sort of sacred science stuff on death. And then my own personal experience of once I moved through a couple of days of freak out, I hung out and I hung out literally every day, almost to this day. I mean, I actually haven't lost the sense that I'm going to die and probably die soon. And again, soon can be identified as two years or 10 years or 20 years, but soon is soon. And I, I treat each season as if it could be my last. Connie and I continue to have actually one of the rituals that I think I shared in Thank God for Evolution around death was saying goodbye to each season, personifying the season and then saying, you know, thank you, Autumn. You've been such an amazing season. If one or both of us dies before we experience you again and we, we stop and pause and actually hold that possibility in our mind that one or both of us dies before we experience th that season again. We just cherish what a blessing you've been. And sometimes I move to tears. It's just, it's a very moving way of reminding myself to take each, don't take any season for granted, take each year, each season as a, as a sacred gift. And, and so, yeah, so all of that's to just give you some background in terms of that. I don't, I don't take the Kubler Ross stages. And that's why when I read what you said, you know, what, what she was like, I don't give a fuck. I don't give a fuck about critiques of the, of the Kubler Ross because I don't use it literally. And I didn't experience it in any immediate way myself in, as that I sort of jumped to acceptance and trust almost immediately and gratitude. That's the other thing. Just, just bathing myself in the gratitude of being able to be alive each day, present to even the challenges, even the dying of our world, the dying of our biosphere, the dying of homo colossus, but from the place of, wow, I'm alive. I get to still make a difference in people's lives. I get to still be involved in my two and a half year old granddaughter's life. We just came back from Florida just last week. So yeah, trust and gratitude and the stages, the feelings commonly associated with grief, namely denial, anger, bargaining, and depression do seem to me to be present for most people related to not just personal stuff, but also especially when you start talking about things like, you know, 
the collapse of civilization and the potential extinction of, of human species and many, 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 many other mammals too. But I think helping people, the average everyday American, since we're speaking in America and we mostly relate to other Americans in our bioregion or city, village, whatever, um, helping the average person, religious or non-religious, to come to terms, not just come to terms, but to truly accept and trust our individual mortality, our collective mortality, move through whatever feelings may be there for them and reoccur, but ultimately hang out in that place of gratitude and awe and then generous contribution. How can they be a blessing to others in, this, in these collapsing times? I just want to bring up something that Connie regularly brings up for me, and it's really vital, which is the recognition that you and I are still in a uh, quite a place of privilege in the Basel's hierarchy in that we don't, we're not looking at starvation in the next month realistically. We're not looking at dying of war in the next month, realistically. We're not looking of social unrest in our little village being so horrific that our kids or grandkids or ourselves are in danger. There are people for whom they're at such a base level now of Maslow's hierarchy, whether it comes to food, water, you know, whatever, that the kinds of more philosophical and sort of what they would deem perhaps as highfalutin sort of concerns and more heartful theological, philosophical death. You know, I mean, I I'm with you entirely. I'm just, it, it's helpful for me to regularly remind our, myself that there are people who are already looking at death or at least really hard times right smack in the face. It's not an abstract thing. It's not something they're reading about in the newspaper. It's on their front porch or the front porch of their daughter or their son or their granddaughter or whatever. Uh, Connie and I, because we lived for 19, almost 19 years traveling all over North America, we got a chance to visit the first green burial place in the United States in South Carolina. And then one or two other places like up in, in uh, Oregon or, or Washington or whatever. And so, yeah, the idea of, of, uh, and, and my literally my closest, oldest, longest male friend, the youngest of 14 children in a Catholic family, organized his whole, his father's entire funeral. He was a milk truck driver. They set the casket up on milk trucks. It was made by the kids. All the kids and grandkids pounded the nails. They all put it in the grave. It was complete. It, they, they didn't use a hearse. They drove from the Catholic church to the cemetery in his milk truck. <laughs> So personalizing all this and then doing it as earthy as possible. Yeah, I'm a full throat today. Men to that. So, uh, you know, just opening that as a possibility to people, you know, they are, I yeah, it's unbelievable how blind, you know, we are to that reality and actually to that gift, that beautiful gift. So then but then the grand finale is right back to you, right back to you, Michael, the new great story. Yes. And my version of that is that, in fact, if I come to the understanding that you have, and I believe I have the same relative to to my death, it's coming and hallelujah, let's let's celebrate. Isn't there a new story of what will continue, what will go beyond and and how is that just as magnificent? as the creation story itself. I fully agree. And, and this is where I have to step back into language that I used a lot in my sort of evolutionary evangelism days and is, is throughout, thank God for evolution, which is the whole day long language, night language distinction. And how to both speak about that in terms of our best understanding of evidential reality and our best understanding of inspiring reality. What ways have people thought about whatever it is that transcends death, whatever it is that goes on, including, <laughs> including humorous things like, you know, somebody says, you know, do you believe in life after death? Oh, absolutely. When I die, life continues. No question. You know? <laughs> you know? But, but how to hold a variety of metaphysical and religious perspectives because i really am a believer of practical truth that that factual truth is what science specializes in global collective intelligence but factual truth is impotent 
really what matters is practical truth, which is if I act as if this is true, I experience personal wholeness, social coherence, ecological integrity. I experience joy and peace, even in the midst of mortality and all that kind of stuff. So how to speak, and this is where I do think the new great story comes in, because I've been in an inquiry for almost a year now, and <laughs> in a very present way in the last month, with, okay, there was a time, like two years ago, when Connie and I thought, ah, eh, the great story, the universe story, that's kind of behind us. Like, okay, that, you know, that was sort of peak age of exuberance. And, you know, we thought, you know, humans of the universe become conscious of itself. And, and but it was all interpreted largely in a human centered rather than in a God centered, G Earth emoji D or life centered way. So it was very much anthropocentric. And so we kind of just, I never rejected it, but we kind of like, okay, I'm not sure, quite sure what to do with that. And then recently, literally just the last two years and especially the last two months, I'm like, holy fuck, am I excited to step back into the universe? In fact, I told Connie literally this morning, literally this morning, that the great story beads, which we did for the first time 21 years ago, I'm going to do a shorter, newer version because it's been two decades since I've acquainted myself with what each of the beads means and what it stands for. And like, how would I do if I were doing for the very first time a timeline, like what in the 14 billion year history of the universe, what are the events that really speak to me, including all my post doom stuff that I now hold that I was close about back then. I was still very into progressivism back then. So how to do that. So I'm, I'm like, I feel like I'm jumping back into the universe story, back into the epic of evolution with two feet. And I've got several speaking engagements that are that are pe people inviting me to do stuff. So they're excited to have that fresh ecological take on the, the great story and a fully mortality celebrating take, individual and collective mortality celebrating take. Now, fortunately, that's there in spades because you've got, you know, chaos, you know, creativity and you, you've got extinctions. You know, that's just a part of the history of life. And so there are lots of different ways to bring the universe story as our first and only globally produced evidence based creation story, which I've said for decades. But now to bring that into an ecological understanding and a post do no gloom global hospice kind of perspective where I actually believe, and I said this to Connie just three hours ago, I actually believe that if somebody asks me, Michael, how do you stay positive? How do you stay, you know, full of joy and gratitude and trust in the midst of all that you know, and in the midst of all of these species going extinct and the chaos that's only starting to pick up speed and like what the next two years is going to be, how do you, how do you do that? And the main ways are grounding myself in, again, G, Earth, Emoji, D, God, but grounding myself in history and in an expanded sense of identity that my myself doesn't stop at my skin. Myself is one with time, 14 billion years, and one with space, the whole cosmos, and certainly Gaia and the Earth. And also my tradition, the various traditions of meaning making, of inspiration, of, of how to deal with life's crises in ways that still get you to the place of personal wholeness, social coherence, you know, which are the, what the great religious traditions do. And my tradition, Christianity, is the one I emerge out of. So, so that sense of identity and history that I get at the great story. So all of this is to say that I'm having sort of a star wars or not star wars uh, what is it, rod sterling the the um you know woo sort of i'm having this experience with you to be having this conversation on this topic with this image here and our history together right when like literally today i've had a huge hour-long walk a ritual walk that i came back and i told connie i said I, this is one of the most inspiring mornings of my life and then debrief with her for two hours and then having this conversation with you and I, I'm like having this like, holy fuck, what an amazing day this is. And we're only at 11.34 here, my time. <laughs> we got a full day. We got another half a day to go. It's like, oh, my <laughs> God, you know. <laughs> and I'm damn sure glad I'm recording this just for my benefit because I'm sure I'll rewatch this. So I stumble a little bit 
I, don't, I, I certainly don't stumble with G Earth Emoji D because there it's like obvious that this is not being used in the same way most people normally do. I stumble a little bit with just spelt normal G-O-D because so many people just think of a supernatural being that's completely divorced from the earth and not present. As they do, their understanding or their concept of God, ultimate reality, ultimate value, ultimate meaning, doesn't include our biophysical creator sustainer. Yeah. The only other thing I wanted to add is the word infinity. The word infinity for me leaves me kind of flat. It's kind of like... Um, yeah, infinite. Infinite and infinity is a concept that I'm not aware that it exists in any oral cultures. It's pr it pretty much comes in with writing, with written language about 5,000 years ago, culturally. And it's one that means a lot to religious people, no doubt, and means a lot to some completely sci secular science-oriented people. But it's one that requires a little bit of explanation Um and so it's, it, you know, all your other ones, you know, forgiveness, love, God, the divine, uh, forgiveness, love, impermanence, presence, purpose, suffering, surrender. Those are all like right there, right on the money. I, I like those. But the word infinity trips me up just a little bit. Okay. So my, my intent there, and that, that's, that's great, um, is by addressing the word infinity, it kind of allows us the opportunity to place ourselves as that single pebble of sand on the beach in in the spectrum of what again you're right we cannot we cannot fathom it but yet to attempt to connect to that infinite that infinite flow of energy that has been a constant since whatever what the beginning was and will continue in the future and this that's the key the key here for me infinity allows me to see the future separate of me and yet i'm a part of it at this moment so I, again defining it's very important yeah no that's that was helpful um i still wonder i'm just sort of in an inquiry i'm just wondering if another word would capture exactly what you just said that wouldn't be a stumbling block to some people one of the things just to give you another sense of probably this happened since we've talked last which was in 2009, I was invited by the chair of the Values Caucus at the United Nations to deliver a presentation to the Values Caucus at the United Nations. I didn't speak to the entire United Nations body. I spoke to the Values Caucus. But there was about 30 people there, uh, 25, 30 people there. And, uh, and I, it was audio recorded. Uh, maybe video recorded, I don't remember. But at any rate, I said, I felt really great about it because I knew I was dealing with a very diverse secular and religious and different kinds of religious group of people um, that, that values and ethics and morality were core. Many different nationalities represented by the people on that values caucus. Um, so I was purposely, the language that I was using in my slides and in my presentation, because it was like an hour and 20 minutes, hour and 50 minute presentation was designed to try to, to so that and i had previously spent two or three years connie and i gave out feedback forms and i was always getting people's feedback like what works what doesn't work is there any language that i'm using that's off-putting that doesn't quite you know resonate with you or that you find challenging whatever so i got that feedback to where by 2009 i knew i had confidence that I could deliver virtually the same program without changing a single slide in radically different settings. And I would get the vast, vast majority of people would say, whoa, that was kick ass. So I figured I'd try it out. So I did a program called Evolution and the Global Integrity Crisis at the United Nations. I sent the audio to Michael Shermer at Skeptic Magazines, one of the most visible atheist humanists in, in North America. And he said, oh, my God, he said, I love this. Even, you know, uh, he said, why don't you, why don't I, I'm in the process of scheduling my Caltech, Skeptic Magazine sponsors a monthly, what they call distinguished lecture at Caltech. He said, I'm in the middle of scheduling that. I've got Bob Wright speaking the month before you. Could you speak, you know, to our group? And I think it was June or whatever. And I was like, yeah, sure. So I delivered the same exact pro. I literally didn't change a single slide. So I went from speaking to the Values Caucus at the United Nations to a group of 350 humanists and atheists at Caltech. And then literally a week, exactly six 
I mean, exactly seven days later, I delivered that same exact program to Michael Beckwith's Agape Spiritual Life Center, which is like this huge New Age mecca. And then three weeks after that at a Catholic church and a week after that at an evangelical church as an evening program at an evangelical church. So evangelicals, Catholics, atheists, uh, New Agers, and the United Nations, those were so different, and yet the exact same program worked for them. So that's what I'm wondering, is if there's a word other than God divine and infinity that might capture some of what you're trying to get at there. And one word that comes immediately to my mind is, well, I use the word reality a lot, but also ultimacy. Um, uh, ultimacy, you know, certainly the, the temporal and spatial dimensions of ultimacy capture that sense of, of, of ongoingness after we go and after, after our solar system goes and after the Milky Way goes, you know, but it doesn't necessarily bring in some of the things that there are some populations that get triggered by religious sounding or woo sounding or spiritual sounding language that, um, uh, that you're that you have in those first two that you may be able to capture everything you want to say without. So that's thank you. Um, have you had a chance to dive into this chat AI stuff at all? Interesting. Not until your email. I mean, yeah, I've read some headlines and knew there were some articles that had been written in the last two months about it. And I never read beyond the article. I just looked at it and thought, oh, God, here's another thing, kind of, you know, whatever. And it's like, oh, you know, whatever. And then about three or four weeks ago, I thought, yeah, at some point, I'll probably want to learn a little bit about it. Just curious. And then your email was like, oh, fuck, I'm going to have to talk to Dwayne and I'm going to have to look at this. So I went on and I've actually got several tabs up on my thing because I'm now thinking, because here's the thing, artificial intelligence is just as stupid as we are. So whoever's programming the artificial intelligence, if they're techno optimists, then that artificial intelligence is gonna is gonna take. If they're ecologically close, so what I want to know from you or as somebody is, how do we ensure that the wisdom? of the kind of books that I've been reading and recording for the last 10 years, William Catton's Overshoot, you know, Walter Youngquist, Geodesic. I mean, there's just a few basic texts that if that wisdom was included in any AI system, holy fuck, would that be awesome? Okay, so amen, amen, and amen. <laughs> um, what I have found, so I, I jumped into your rabbit hole. Okay, Michael Dowd, tell me about Michael Dowd. Tell me about, you know, bum, 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 bum. I'm telling you, Michael, it ain't perfect, but holy shit. It's, it, you know, I mean, the, what you can take from it is so good. You know, it's kind of like that 80 20 rule, right? 80% of it takes you so, you know, it just leapfrogs. Yeah. Um, my first version of what, just for the giggles of it, my first version of, of this uh, grief book, I wrote in four hours. What it would have taken me two months at minimum, you know, and it was very simple, don't get me wrong, but still using that tool, just boom, boom, boom. Because, you, you know, once you get a response, you say, tell me more. And they zip deeper. And once you get that, you say, but, but what about this? I'm kind of concerned about what does this really mean? And zoom, it comes right at you. So I, I don't pretend to have all the answers, but I want to at least plant the seed in you. There's more good there than you might think. Well, you've you've planted the seed already. You've just watered the seed with that uh, uh, rhetorical flourish of enthusiasm. Um, the question that I will not will not um, the thing that has bit me. I will find out how does one go about who are the people, who are the institutions, what communications need to happen to make sure that, say, for example, the most important book I've ever read in my life, William Catton's Overshoot, and any, any artificial, I mean, many people consider that the most important book of the 20th century. Some actually have said it's the most important book ever written. How does that understanding that worldview how do i make sure that whoever are the people who are programming this this chat ai thing incorporates that the, the kind of ecological wisdom 
that is embodied in a few classic texts that once any artificial intelligence system incorporates that as well, oh my God, could it be a service to humanity in some major, 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 major ways in a way that it's not if it's only like the input that it's getting is coming from Steven Pinker and all the techno optimists and all that, you know, whatever. So there, there's no question that there's a bias still built within them of, of hopium. Okay. No, question. there is yeah. in fact, in every, everything it does, it, it, uh, it, it does the, uh, the, when it writes stories, it's the hero, it's the hero story. Um, but, but again, though, um, what it does so quickly and how it can feed you so far, I'm, I'm finding just delightful. However, I want to leave you with this thought. Okay. I had a chance to watch a couple of the videos of the guy behind this technology, mm -hmm. the, the lead player. Mm -hmm. And he is forthright saying where this is really going to make, you know, make its leapfrog is when a specific group grabs its capability and feeds it. And that's what I think I heard you saying just moments ago. That is what you heard me say. I do know that it's possible and holy shit. Am I excited about being, because that would be, that would be a way in the same, in the same way that I feel like one of the key elements of my great work, like my life purpose, what am I here to serve? is to ensure that Connie is able to do this assisted migration tree work as effectively and efficiently and successfully as possible, because that's going to long outlast, you know, humanity and everything else, you know? And so to how to inspire say dozens or hundreds of people to participate in assisted migration work is just holy, holy, holy fucking work. The thought that I could be a part or learn how to be a part of a group of people, I mean, I'm, believe me, I'm connected to it. It would be not difficult uh, uh, that would feed artificial intelligence with the truly important information it needs to know, which is ecological historical understanding. Holy fuck! Does that? I mean, that feels like what? A, I mean, if I died after doing that, I, 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 I've done what I needed to do. I mean, it feels that potentially that big. So. This is now about the sixth thing that has occurred this day, February 14th, 2023, why I will write down in my life story calendar, which I keep a life story calendar. I don't know if I ever shared this with you. I have a, it's called a spiritual diary, but it's 365 pages and every page I've got two to 20 different items of things that have happened on that day. So today is February 14th. And so I can see, oh, in 2009, I did this. In 1988, I did that or whatever. And so today is a day that's going down in my life story calendar. And I will actually mention A, B, C, D, all the things that occurred to me. is like fucking big today. And this conversation has got two of them just in this conversation. That's wonderful. <laughs> Oh, I gotta love you, man. I gotta love you. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, and and my my eco theological worldview is one that sees these kinds of conversations as providential. As this is the universe conspiring on my behalf. This is God, you know, inspiring me for the rest of my life, as short or long as that may be. And so I choose not because I actually believe there's an intelligence that somehow signaled me out to do this. I mean, who the fuck knows? But certainly I act if I act as if that's the case, like this conversation had to happen. It was destined to happen and it destined to happen today. And like, oh, I mean, I get some really like woo woo, like, you know, I call it sacred earth woo. It's like I get goosebumps. It's like, holy fuck, this is awesome. You know, so I'm easily able to step into that without necessarily taking it literally. I take it as practical truth is if I act as if this conversation with Dwayne was meant to happen and it was meant to happen today and it was meant to build on everything that's already occurred for the last five hours in terms of Rebbies for me, man, as I imagine waking up tomorrow morning, I got a clarity that I didn't have when I woke up this morning. Thank you. Love Thank you, man. You, have a great I, I love you too. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.